because we believe that we've been made kings and queens in the land, in the kingdom of God, and we believe that kings and queens make declarations, and when they do, that there's authority behind them. So we believe wholeheartedly to ask God and petition God for the good things of the kingdom. We do it every single week here. Um, one quick announcement. It's kind of also a testimony along with it. So this last Tuesday, um, Tuesday morning, uh, me, Nate, and Bill were gathering and talking and praying together. And <clears throat> so what, what I did after our prayer time, I said, okay, what I feel like we're going to do is we're going to start, we see the, this revival happening a little bit within our church as it relates to prayer. We see that people are just kind of naturally taking up this mantle to, hey, we need to be a praying church. Naturally, people are feeling like, hey, are we praying enough? Can we pray more often? And I was like, all right, well, let's just set a space for us to come together and pray. So I gave plenty of excuses for people to get out of this. But I said, hey, Wednesday morning at 6.30 a.m., we're going to gather and pray together. And I said, Tuesday, I made this announcement. So I gave 24 hours the next day at 6.30 a.m., only announced it on Facebook. I was trying to give people as many outs as they wanted to have, basically. But 24 hours later, we had eight or nine people show up ready to pray at 6.30 a.m. And the crazy part is I had, you know, another handful of people text me saying, hey, if we do this again, I want to come. I can't make it this morning, but I want to come in the future. And for the days and things following, the whole experience, miraculously, the 6.30 a.m. prayer meeting had very positive feedback, which I did not expect. To gather at 6.30 a.m. in prayer, a lot of people aren't real excited about that, but that's something that we got positive feedback and excitement for, and so we're going to do it again this coming week, Thursday morning. Thursday morning at 6.30 a.m., we'll be gathering here at Kingdom Life to pray, to partner with God in bringing heaven to earth, ask the Holy Spirit, what do you need prayer for? What needs to be prayed for so that God will move here, right? We're going to ask him, what, do you, what, what are people not praying for? Where is there a gap between earth and heaven that we can fill that space and intercede for people for situations, for our city, whatever it might be. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us in that. And we're just going to go for it. Keep making the space to pray. So if you want to pray, 6.30 a.m., Thursday morning. It's crazy. Yeah, you got you to gotta want it for that. All right, you guys are all invited. Um, if you want to turn, we're going to be in Colossians 1 today. If we haven't said it yet, happy Easter, right? Happy Easter. Today is the day where we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That's a big deal. That a real man really lived a perfect life, really was put to death, and really came back to life. Rose from the dead, conquered death, conquered sin, and conquered the devil all in one. And now we are victorious with him as believers who have put their faith in the hope of that truth. All right, and I'm excited this morning to share with you guys because we get to focus completely on the resurrection of Jesus, focus completely on the gospel. We try to do it every single week, but I have every excuse to do it here today. And as I prayed this week, I believe that we have people here who are frustrated with Christianity or tired out by Christianity. I believe we got people here that have grown up in the church, have attended church often, who have even heard this gospel message often and are kind of tired out by it. Not only tired out by it, but tired by the Christian faith. What I mean by that is, is they've heard the message, they've seen the people living a Christian life, they've even tried it themselves, and it hasn't really been that big of a transformation for them. They know the truth, they know how they're supposed to live, and they've tried it, they followed all the rules, they went to church, they read their Bible, they tried praying, they tried doing all the things that church and people told them to do, but on the other side of it, they're like, this is kind of weak. And on the other side of it, I still am struggling with the same exact things I was struggling with before. Right? And that's discouraging. You don't want to go back to something if you continuously fail at it. You feel like, I know what the standard is. I try to live up to it. I fall short. Okay? Christianity can become tiring if that's the faith that you grew up with. On the other side of it, I know that there's people here who have really messy pasts, right? And made a lot of bad decisions, made a lot of sinful decisions. If we gave you time to share your story, we'd have to take like four service times because there's so much story to tell, right? We got people here on that side too. And in the same way, Christianity, you can see the people that have the hope and have the freedom and have entered into the other side of things and are living a life that's hope-filled, joy-filled, peace-filled, living in victory, really free from the lifestyle they used to live, right? We have people here who were addicted. We have people here who were incarcerated, who were living a life of crime. 
people here that were trafficked, people here that have really been lost in the past of, of the sin and depravity that the world had to offer. And on the other side of things, we have people here that are free from those same things, that are really living life with Jesus. Right? So we believe in the power of the gospel, and I know there are people here today who are tired out by the church and tired out by the sin of their past and haven't fully understood or stepped into the freedom that's available for you. Because that's what Jesus came to do. He came to bring liberty, came to bring freedom, came to bring sight to the blind, came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So if you feel like you're a captive, if you feel like you're not free, if you feel like you're in bondage to anything, what Jesus came to do is to bring real freedom, all the way freedom. All right, so if you guys are in Colossians 1, I'm going to read, I'm going to start in verse 11, I believe. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the good news of the gospel that we're talking about here. Verse 11 says, may you be strengthened. And this is the midst of Paul is writing this letter to the church at Collis, and he's saying, this is my prayer for you. This is right in the middle of that prayer that he's been praying for them. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The truth of the gospel is that we have the opportunity to have our sins completely forgiven, to be completely redeemed, to be brought into the kingdom of the light in the kingdom with Jesus Christ. And the even better news, if you read there, it says that the father has qualified you. That God has delivered you into that kingdom. The power of the gospel, the peace that frustrates people because they miss it, is that the work was done by somebody else. To enter into redemption from your sins, to enter into this conquering lifestyle, to be completely free, to be in the kingdom of the light, somebody else delivered you into that. Somebody else qualified you for that. There's a scripture in Ephesians that communicates it really well, too. We'll start Ephesians, I think it's verse 1 where we're going. Start there. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. After that it says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. What can you do if you're dead? There's nothing you can really do if you're dead, right? You're dead. You were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. He made us alive with Christ. Go on a couple more verses. Verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing because you were dead. You couldn't do anything. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works. There's nothing you can work at or do to earn this gift. It's a free gift. So that no one may boast. See, God set us up. God did the heavy lifting. The first element of the gospel, the most important element of the gospel that we must understand is that we have done nothing for it. That God loved us while we were his enemies, while we were still sinners. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to earth to be the ultimate sacrifice. Because Romans 6.23 says that the wage of sin or the payment you receive from sin is death. Just three chapters before that, Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned. Everyone, every person ever born, ever to live has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Both those scriptures tell us that the free gift of God is eternal life despite that sin, despite that wage we have earned, despite death that we deserve. It says, Jesus came and lived a perfect life. Jesus, the Son of God, came, lived a perfect life, and died for us. In other words, he was the propitiation for our sins. Look that one up later, the church word. He was the propitiation. He paid the price for us and died. That's a big deal. Because verse 15 in Colossians tells us this, that he is the image of the invisible God. He was the firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus, all things were created. 
in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And in Jesus, he was before all things, and in Jesus, all things hold together. Jesus is God. That's crazy. He came and lived as a man. He was born. He had to grow up. He went through the toddler age, the teenage age, all those awkward phases that we all have to go through. He went through them. And he did it for you because you couldn't pay the penalty yourself. You couldn't do anything. It's not by your own works. It's by nothing you've done. We were incapable. We were dead. But he delivered us to a new kingdom. He qualified us for this new kingdom. He gave us a perfect gift of grace to put us in this new kingdom. Not only mercy to forgive us for sins, but to be forgiven and then take you and plant you in the kingdom of light. The first thing we must understand about the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news he came to bring, is that he does everything. You can't be too messy. You can't be too broken or too sinful or too lost. You can't have tried too many times because it's not about how hard or how many times you try. It doesn't matter. None of the things that have to do with your behavior matter. Can I say that? Your behavior doesn't matter and still be in church and still feel like, wait a second. Because that stuff's down the road. That stuff will come eventually. First and foremost, the gospel of Jesus says it's not about your behavior. It's not about what you do and don't do. That's not what it's about. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you do because Jesus, God, reveals the heart of the Father to us perfectly. It says he is the image of the invisible God. So the way Jesus interacts with the people here on earth, we get a glimpse of how God feels about those same people. Do you remember the woman who was caught in adultery? It says caught in the act of adultery. The religious people caught her in the act of adultery, grabbed her and dragged her out, put her before Jesus, saying, this woman was just caught in the act of adultery. In the act of adultery. In the act. Adultery means having sex with someone outside of your marriage. She was caught in the act and dragged out. Put before Jesus, saying, should we stone this woman? They began gathering stones because this is what the law said. This is what you do. And Jesus stopped for a moment, drew in the sand. I wish I knew what he drew. It doesn't say, though. But he wrote in the sand and he stood up and he said, hey, you who are without sin may cast the first stone. And what happened? Each of them, from starting with the oldest down to the youngest, dropped the stones and walked away from the woman who was caught in adultery until it was just Jesus and the lady. And she goes, has no one here condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. He says, neither do I then condemn you. Go and sin no more. So right now, today, no matter what you are in, no matter what you might be caught in, in this moment, in the darkest, most depraved moment of your life, he can catch you in that place, the worst place you've ever been by your own doing, in the midst of your worst decision of your life, dragged before the religious leaders, the people of your town, and Jesus, God himself. God says, no one is here to condemn you. It's just about me, and what I say is I forgive you. You are forgiven. What did she do? Did she do anything during that? No, she was doing something else. Dragged before him, he says, you are forgiven. That's God interacting with his people. Jesus is the invisible image, the perfect image. You see the way that God's heart breaks for people who are in sin. For the most broken people there are, the tax collectors who stole money from people, who cheated people out of money, Jesus says, why don't you come talk to me? Let's go eat together. Let's go gather together. You are the most despised members of society. That's okay. Let's talk. Let me show you the perfect love of the Father. Let me show you how a kingdom is really built, not with money and finances and things, but with the love and generosity and gift of love that I have available for you. Right? Zacchaeus' response is, I'm going to give half my money to the poor. I'm going to repay everybody four times what I took from them. Jesus, the love, the love of God, it encounters anybody and everybody and introduces them to their creator, saying, you are saved. You don't have to do anything. You're saved. Put your faith in what Jesus did. It's not about what you do. 
for those of you that are saying, I'm glad I'm not that guy. I'm glad I'm not one of those people. I'm glad I've never fallen that deeply into sin. For the people who follow the religion well but have never been encountered by the living God with a heart transformation, Holy Spirit now living inside of you, but you follow the rules well, Jesus gets real honest with the Pharisees. I believe it's Matthew 23. You can see how God feels about the hyper-religious who, as Jesus says, slams the door to the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, who ties up heavy burdens around their necks, who's willing to tithe all the seasonings in their cupboard, the the mint, the dill, the cumin. I'm going to tithe the tenth of all of those things, but you're going to ignore the important, weightier parts of the law, righteousness, judgment, mercy. You ignore the most important stuff. You clean the outside of the cup while ignoring the inside. You do all your good works before men. Jesus goes off on them for like a full chapter there. And this is right before they're already trying to kill him. And now he's calling them out in front of everybody. We see the heart of God towards religion, towards that hyper-religious, judgmental people who do their good works before men. Jesus calls them, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, which were huge burns back in the day. Not as big of a deal now, but those were huge back then. We see the heart of God in Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God because he is God. He was there in creation, in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. Verse 18. This is a good one. And he is the head of the body, the church. I'm glad God gave me permission to go here. And he is the head of the body, the church. Has anybody here ever been hurt by the church? Ever few hands yeah that's big that's big you've been hurt by the church have you ever been surprised by the behavior of someone who says they're a Christian yeah there's a few more there have you ever heard anybody to say they're all hypocrites or have you ever said church the people in church they're all hypocrites have you ever heard that yeah praise God they're right we're hypocrites But guess what? Our leader is Jesus, is God. He's perfect. He's always faithful. He always does it right. We're just trying our best to follow him. I'll admit I'm flawed. Absolutely. The leadership is going to fail here. The leadership is going to fall short. We're going to miss it on some things. We're human. We're not going to make every phone call we should make. We're not going to be as considerate or thoughtful or as compassionate as we should be. We'll fail you. I don't care how good our leadership team is, and I think we have the best one in the world, but we will still fail you. If you put your faith in me or in Nate or in Bill or any of the leaders here, any of the people here, we'll let you down. I guarantee it. We'll we'll be hypocritical in the way we speak compared to the way we behave. It'll happen. Hopefully, if you've ever said that, if you've ever called the church hypocrites, if you ever looked on the outside and saying, look at that guy, he calls himself a Christian. If you've ever been at the hurt end of the church behaving or dealing with someone incorrectly or dealing with you incorrectly, I hope instead of judgment and spite and hate, you can say, you know what, I might have just found a home. Because surely you're not saying that your behavior is above what they have done. Surely you can't look at your past and say, out of all the times I've been hurt, all the times I've been betrayed, all the times I've been lied to by other people, no one has hurt me, betrayed me, or lied to me more than myself. Right? Be careful because you just might have found a home. This might be the place you fit in well. Right? Yeah. And this is going to be messy. If you're doing church right, church is messy. Isn't it? I mean, people, new Christians are compared to babies and toddlers. I've got one baby, 10 months old. The second week she was alive, she puked in my mouth. (laughs) That's serious. It was up, too. It was on this angle, 45 degree up. Puked in my mouth, ran down my beard. I smelled it for like three days. Any of you that know, that's the worst smell ever. I've changed her diaper, and she's going to hate me someday, but not yet. She can't understand this yet. She pooped against the whole wall. (laughs) Ruined a lampshade. The whole, everything on this side of her was ruined. Tried to clean it up. I've heard terrible, terrible rumors that as they continue to grow up as two-year-olds, three-year-olds, that when they're napping, they'll actually take their diaper off and redecorate the room? Has anybody ever experienced that? Is that real? Awesome. Lot to look forward to, right? That's what new Christians are, are compared to. 
I'm terrified for those days. But listen, if you're doing church right, if you're bringing new people into the kingdom, it's going to be messy. Good luck trying to help and to deal with, we, we, we have a bunch of new Christians here. Have you ever dealt with multiple children at once? I know the naps they have, right? Wherever you guys are. They got eight, nine, a lot. I see you sat in the back smiling. It's messy, right? Yeah. Welcome to church. Luckily, our faith isn't in us. It's in Jesus Christ, creator of the universe. He's got all the wisdom. He lived a perfect life. He never did anything wrong. They still put him to death after about 30 years. He was perfect. He's always faithful. If he's promised something, he will always fulfill it. It, the issue is never on his end. If you're having issues with the church, it's probably the people. It's not because of God. He's all-knowing. He is everywhere. He's capable of anything, of interacting with this world in supernatural ways. So Jesus is the head of our church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. This is one that people are going to have an issue with. I know we have some new people here today, and there's, there's a thing that we're celebrating today. I mentioned it earlier. We believe that Jesus came back from the dead. We, us, along with over the last 2,000 years, billions of people, as it relates to the idea of Jesus coming back to the dead, they believe, yes, I put all of my faith in the idea that Jesus of Nazareth, the historical figure, the biblical character, Jesus of Nazareth, was put to death, was buried, and rose up again alive. You need to have an opinion about it. You need to have an opinion about that. Billions of people have put their faith in it. But that's one of the biggest issues you're going to get pushback on. Right? Biblically, we see he is not just a good man. He's not just a good teacher. He doesn't just have cool prophetic words that he speaks. No, this man is God. Biblically, you can't read this and say this man is anything other than God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No other way to God the Father except through him. That's what he says. He is God. And there is a lot, a lot in here as it relates to him coming back from the dead. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in chapter 15. He says, Jesus came back from the, light, came back from the dead, appeared to the women, appeared to the apostles, appeared to these people, these people, appeared to 500 people most of whom are still alive, though some have passed away. And last of all, he appeared to me as well. Paul, writing this letter to the church at Corinth, saying he appeared to more than 500 people. Most of them are still alive. Reading between the lines there, he's writing a letter to say, 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead, he said, some have died, most are alive. Go ask the people who saw Jesus. They're still alive. That's, that's, the, that's the thing that Paul writes down. If you don't believe me, if you're not buying into this, go ask the people who saw him. They're alive still. Not to mention the guy, Paul, who wrote this letter. He said, last of all, he appeared to me, the one who deserved it the least. Because if you don't know the story of Paul, before he was the guy who wrote all these letters, the guy who was shipwrecked and beaten and stoned and left for dead, who was starving, was thrown in prison, was thrown into torture chambers. This guy who decided to go after all that before that, he was one of those Pharisees. He was really one of the most qualified Pharisees, taught by the most respected rabbi. He had money, he had fame, he had a path ahead of him that was going to give him importance for all of his days. He was set up to be the priest of all priests of Jerusalem. And he was going around, literally, his job, what he was going and doing, was getting approval from the different authorities to go and kill Christians. When Stephen was killed, he was standing there giving his approval. That was his thing. He would go around and kill Christians. After Jesus rose and all that, he would go around now killing the followers of Jesus, trying to stamp the faith out. And it says, now me, myself, I believe Jesus appeared to me so much that I'm going to go from favored Religious leader, Pharisee, the best of the best, a life that's set up for success, and I'm going to choose to be tortured. I'm going to choose to go against the people, go back to the people that I was killing. I'm going to become one of them. Shipwrecked, bring it on. Tortured, bring it on. Stoned to death, but I survived, bring it on. And I'll wander back in the city after they stoned me to preach to them some more. This dude stood up to it. 
Switch faith. The Twelve disciples, have you ever read how they were killed? Or that they were all killed? The only one that survived was actually boiled alive and didn't kill him. Yeah, they went and put him on a different island because they didn't want to look at him anymore. They let people crucified upside down, crucified, speared through them, stoned. All 12 of the disciples, all of them, were killed or boiled alive and not quite killed. None of them gave up Jesus. All of them stood to the very end after torture after torture and said, no, Jesus, I still believe, came back from the dead. Easter season, I love Easter season. One for the History Channel because they come up with a new theory every few years on how this might have happened, who might have stolen the body, or all these different ideas that might have come across. And over and over again, it's, I've got to be like, man, don't you see, these guys wouldn't die for something they lied or made up. Like, hey, let's, let's do this. Let's steal the body. Say they did steal the body, and let's create a story and try to build this whole religion. It doesn't make sense for them to be tortured and killed and say, no, I still believe this. For what? You're getting crucified upside down, man. Give it up. At some point, give it up. Nope. Every single one stood up and said, Jesus is the Savior of the world. The other reason I like Easter is because all the memes that come out, they're funny, right? I saw one this morning when I woke up that said, I know that the resurrection is real because 12 men who were tortured, they were fishermen, they didn't have any formal education. These 12 men stood up until the very end for 40 plus years saying, Jesus is the Son of God, the light of the world, salvation comes only through him, he came back to life, and they stuck with their story for 40 years. But the Watergate scandal had 12 men who were some of the most powerful men in the world couldn't hold their story straight for three weeks. And it all came out. <laughs> That's hilarious. So we believe that Jesus is the beginning, that he is the firstborn from the dead, that he might be preeminent in everything. He came back to life. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Again, he was God. He represented God perfectly. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. That's a good one. He's reconciling to himself all things, not just us, not just the people, but he is redeeming and reconciling the entire world. The things that the world, that sin, that the devil has taken and twisted and put out of context of God's creation, he is redeeming all of those things back to himself. Did you know sex was God's idea? The world has twisted it, the world has taken it, but sex was, God created that. And he had a perfect plan that it would be pleasurable and good and, repopul and populate the whole world. He didn't create things and say, like, go get a cup of coffee and come back and be like, no, what are you guys doing? No, that's not why I gave you that. He didn't come back and be surprised by sex. He created it for the pleasure of his people. And he had cre created it with an intended purpose that it would be an act of worship, of glorifying, that we would enjoy it, that it would be a holy thing. The world has twisted it and brought it someplace else, but God created it, and he is redeeming all of those things. Things that the world has stolen and tried to put their own stamp on it. God says, no, that's my creation. I will redeem it. And that's one of our roles as the church is to help, to partner with that redemption process. That the church, called the bride of Christ, would be presentable to Jesus on the final day on the day of judgment, on our wedding day, where we meet with Jesus in heaven again. We are redeeming, we are sanctifying the body until we go to heaven, until Jesus returns to take us up with him again. Verse 21, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That's what he does. Saying, I'm doing all the heavy lifting. It's by nothing you've done. It's a gift of grace, not a result of works, so that I can present you as holy, blameless, above reproach. Not with your behavior, but you are put in a position. It says he transferred us from one domain into the next. There's no process with that. 
2 Corinthians 5, it says that the old has gone, the new has come. A brand new identity that is not recognizable compared to the old one. Separates our sins as far as the east is from the west. We are forgiven when we put our faith in him and what he's done. We are made new and we are transferred to the kingdom of light, even if we keep sinning. We are his children. He has adopted us, given us a new identity. It's nothing you've done. Are you guys getting that? Have you heard me say it yet? It's by nothing that you do or have done. He transferred you. But here's a big one. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister, that he is reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. That's, that's one that's caused confusion. I've had that conversation with people. Like, no, there's an if in this equation. It says that I am saved, that I am redeemed, that I am made new if I continue in the faith, if I'm stable, if I'm steadfast. And people can get confused on that. I thought it wasn't based on what I do. It's based on what Jesus has done and what God said and what God has given me. But it's saying you need to remain stable, steadfast, continue to remember the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is that Jesus did it. Remain faithful to it. Remain stable and steadfast and remembering when you get confused, when you fail, when you sin, remember the hope of the gospel isn't in your behavior. Remember, remain stable, remain steadfast. Don't get frustrated and anxious and, man, I just keep failing. It's not about you. It's about what Jesus has already done. You know how I can tell if you're a mature believer in the faith? Is if when you screw up, when you fail, when you sin, do you run away from God because, woe is me, I screwed up again. I can't earn his love. I'm done. I'm going to clean myself up before I get back to church. I have to clean myself up before I go among his people again. I feel guilty and shamed. I can't believe I did that. I'm not worthy of it. Or when you sin, when you fail, when you screw up, do you run to the arms of your God who says, that's not what you're defined by. You are new. You have a brand new identity. I now see you the way I saw Jesus. And when Jesus came up out of the water of his baptism, God said, this is my son. And I am proud of him. I am proud of him. He hasn't started his ministry yet even. But God says, this is my son in whom I'm proud of, in whom I am well pleased. That's how he sees you. And when you sin, when you fail, when you live up to your hypocritical title, it's going to be up to you if you're going to continue faithfully, steadfast, and stable to say, God, that's not who I am. You call me a son. You say I'm perfect. You say I'm holy. You say I'm blameless. You've given me a brand new identity, and I'm not going to choose to run away from it and live into what I feel like I am, what my emotions tell me. I'm not going to live even into my behavior of how I've acted. I'm going to choose to exist in the holy, blameless place that you've set aside for me. That is not you anymore. You are no longer a sinner saved by grace. You were. Now you are a son. You are a daughter of the king. And it's not about what you've done. It's not by your works. No one can brag. No one can say I'm better or I've done really well. Look how well I've existed as a Christian. No way. Are you kidding? The Bible tells us even our good works are like dirty, filthy, menstrual rags. That's what our good works are like. There's no bragging. There's no boasting in your behavior. There's no saying, look how good of a Christian I am. It's saying, look how good God is. He took care of it. And now I will continue steadfast, stable, faithfully proclaiming the hope of the gospel that he accomplished it. He is good. He is faithful. He, he has redeemed me. He has reconciled me. He is redeeming the whole world back to himself. And sin is not going to distract me. Poor decisions, selfishness are not going to be what I'm defined by anymore. And then, at that point, when you've accepted the hope of the gospel, that it's not about you. I'm going to, it's not about you. As soon, the best thing you can do for salvation, if you're not saved, 
If you haven't put your faith in God, get over yourself. It's not about how good or bad you are. Get over yourself. The gospel isn't about you. The gospel is about what God has done for you that you can live a new life. When you get this identity, when you're saying, okay, I'm going to put my faith that Jesus died for me so that I can live victorious. He came back to life. God brought him out of the grave victorious over the death that my physical body might not be able to avoid. Victorious over the devil that has tempted me and identified me as a sinner and constantly is lying to me. I'm victorious with Jesus over that. The sin that once defined me, my testimony and my story, all the addiction, the sin, the law-breaking, all of my worst decisions are my old self. I'm going to say I accept what you call me. I'm going to learn to try to understand and soak in God's love for me. And when you begin to wrap your mind around that you don't need to do anything, it's a free gift of God, Your response to that truth, when it levels you, when that wrecks you to understand that you don't deserve it, that while you were his enemy, while you were still a sinner, he gave himself up to torture and to death on a cross. He faced it boldly for you. When you wrap your mind around that, you can't help but respond to that truth of the gospel and say, Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you you've given me a new identity. Thank you from saving me from my sin, from saving me from myself, from saving me from hell forever. Not only have you saved me, but you've put me in a place of the kingdom of your beloved son, the kingdom of light, king of the world. You are his son. You are his daughter. And the way you live your life is no longer how good am I doing, how bad am I doing, but it's when you're faced with a decision to choose selfishness, to choose sin, you start to believe the identity that God gave you. Renew your mind to what God says, not to how you feel. And you begin to say, a son of God doesn't behave that way. A daughter of the king, a beloved daughter, doesn't do those things. I'm going to live a life of worship that scripture calls me to. Whether you're eating, whether you're drinking, or whatever you do, do it all as an act of worship to God. You were created for that. You were created to say thank you. You were created to praise him. You were created to worship him. You were created to glorify him in every arena of your life. And when your life is no longer defined by right and wrong and doing and not doing and feeling and saying and all these different behaviors you're always trying to measure and always going to get frustrated with when you accept it's not about you, but instead I'm going to live my life saying, God, thank you for saving me. God, thank you for giving me a new identity. God, thank you that you have given me your Holy Spirit living inside of me that when I feel weak, I can run into your presence. And you are always faithful to deliver. The new life, the gospel-transformed life, the faith, the steadfastness and stability that comes from putting your hope in what Jesus did instead of how you behave is life-transforming. And listen, guys, I don't want you guys to live in a fake relationship with him. The way I love my wife is intimate. I adore her. I'm obsessed with her. I tell her that all the time. I'm sorry I'm so obsessed with you. I don't want to read a book about her. I don't want to look at pictures of her. I don't want to just have a conversation over the phone where we have specific questions, a devotional question book that I talk to her over the phone a little bit. I don't want a long-distance relationship with her. I want to kiss her on the mouth. I want to cuddle her. I want to hold her. I want to annoy her. I want to be with her every moment I can be with her. I want to experience her face to face. I want to be really with her. I don't just want to Facebook stalk her. Right? And I don't want you to have a Facebook stalkery relationship with God. 
that's, that's, that's nothing. I don't want you just to read a book about God. I don't want you to have a long-distance relationship. I don't want you to be disconnected or feel like he's always kind of 15, 20 steps away. Or maybe we can talk tomorrow, maybe the next day. I guess I'll go to church on Sunday and listen to other people talk about you. I don't want other people talking about my wife. I want to talk with her. I don't want anybody else to teach me about my wife. I want to interact and learn her and study her. I want you to have that relationship with God who loves you more than anyone could ever love you and loves you more than you could ever love anyone else. And the good news, guys, is that he loves you all the way, the maximum amount, right now. Even if you're that woman that literally was caught in the act of adultery, dragged before the people, worst moment in your life, exposed to everyone, in that moment, God loves you all the way. Because it's not dictated by how you behave or how poorly or how good you do. A father's love, the father's perfect love is that you are my child. I'm proud of you. I love you. And he's not a father who's annoyed like a father can be annoyed from his kid asking for a Twinkie every five minutes before dinner. Right? If you ask me one more time, right, that's what a a normal father's reaction is. God's saying, no, ask me again. Ask me for a Twinkie again. Dinner's in a couple hours, but go ahead, ask me again. I don't care. I'm not going to get annoyed with you. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. He's not going to get annoyed with you. He wants every bit of you on a personal level because he adores you. Sinner saved wherever you fall on that, that whole scale. God loved the world so much, the whole world, everything in the world that he sent Jesus to die for our sins, that if we put our faith in him, no one should have to perish, but we can live eternally. And I'm telling you guys, you're not here on accident. This is an opportunity for everybody in the room. You need to wrestle with this. I'm telling you, I believe a guy came back from the dead and that he was God. And that because of him, I have a whole new life. The old me is gone, the new has come. That I live in a supernatural environment. That I have joy and peace that can't be taken away. I have love that isn't affected by your behavior. I love you. Doesn't matter how you treat me. The fruits of the Spirit comes out of the life of those who follow after Jesus. And you will begin to see the more you hang out here, That the people here love you. That despite our circumstances, joy is there. Peace is there. God promised it to us. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's what the people of God are going after. That's what we want. And the people who are not of God are going after the same thing. It's different arenas. You're not going to find joy in the stuff you attain, the money you have, the Peace is not going to come when your bank account reaches a certain level. The love you are seeking isn't going to come from people because, like we said, they will let you down. The only person that can hold that pedestal in your life is your creator, your father, God. I'm inviting you guys. You can have an intimate, real relationship with him. It's real, I promise coming from somebody who avoided church with every fiber of his being for most of his life. I have no right to stand up here and talk about or for God. No right to be up here. It's not about what I've done, though. It's about this new call he has placed on me, this new gift he has given me, and he has qualified. He has delivered me here. You can go all around the room, like Nate said, We could have testimony time, and you could hear the stories of people who have interacted with the real, living God. We believe in him for real. And we want to walk alongside you guys. We want to be a part of this thing with you guys, this messy thing they call the church. It's messy. It's difficult sometimes. We learn together, and we walk together, and we continue to point forward to the good news of the gospel that Jesus accomplished it, so our messiness isn't going to ruin it. Let me pray with you guys. Watch. God, 
thank you so much for your perfect plan. That the sin of the world didn't surprise you. That Judas, one of Jesus' closest friends, him betraying Jesus didn't surprise you. God, you weren't surprised when your chosen people put your son to death. God, thank you that you took that ugliest moment in history and you turned it into the most poetic example of love. That that what looked like darkness, what looked like brokenness, what looked like murder, God, was our road to redemption. That through the work of Jesus, we can put our faith in the fact that you have redeemed us now. You have reconciled yourself back to us. You have made peace where we were enemies. The sin in our life is no longer what defines us, but we are now your sons and daughters. And God, if there is anyone here who does not understand or know that, God, I pray you would bring conviction. Holy Spirit, soften the hearts of the people here who don't know you. God, if there is anyone here who is saying, this sermon was for me, Let me speak directly to you. If you felt like I was preaching to you the whole time, that's the way that God works. God works in unique ways that even the words that I say, when we're not talking about the same thing, God will convict your heart and wake something up inside of you because this is what you were created for. He's drawing you in. He's showing you what you were created for the same way that he longs to redeem the things that the world had stolen. He wants to redeem the passions inside of you, the gifts that he's given to you, the way he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he longs for you to bring those things into the kingdom. They're meant for redemption. They're meant to be an act of worship back to your creator. with everybody's eyes closed and everybody's heads bowed, I want you guys to engage with me a little bit. If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, atoning sacrifice, and you want to say, I'm putting my hope in what you did, Jesus, would you guys mind just looking up and looking at me? If you're putting your faith in Jesus Christ right now, will you look up at me just so I can know who is? Praise God. People all over the room, guys. Thank you. Thank you. God, thank you for this love that wakes us up. Thank you, God, that you've called us into a glorious kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, that you promise never to leave us, never to forsake us, and to be with us to the ends of the earth. That there is no place we can go to escape from your presence. And God, I pray that you would inspire every person here to live a life of thankfulness back to you. You are so good. We love you, we praise you, and we honor you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. And we pray these precious things in your name. Amen.